Hi, everyone. I'm sharing with former guest and friend Dan McPherson some of the work that I'm doing preparing for the book, but also workshops on sustainability and sustainability leadership. So here's a sneak preview of what's to come. We see here in my ecological footprint, in, I went to the site Global Footprint Network, and you answer a bunch of questions about your behavior. So I did that for me in 2016. And it turns out that I, if everybody in the world lived as I did, we would need 4.3 Earths to sustain that population. So that's unsustainable. How does that compare with others? So the US average at that time, or at this time right now, is if everybody in the world lived the way the US does, we would need five Earths. I'm a little bit below. So by this point, I was vegan, live in New York City, so I don't have a car. On the other hand, uh, I flew a lot. So that brought me back up to average. 2016 was when I stopped flying. Here's the world average. So it's like a third of the world average, of the US average. And I think a lot of people in the US say, oh, we have to bring people here up to us, conflating consumption with quality of life. But those things are not equal. And when people, when, if we were, we think we should lead the world, but the rest of the world doesn't look for us for leadership in this area at all. I think they look at us with fear. If we really wanted to lead the world, we would have to lower down. But a lot of people, if you conflate quality of life with consumption and waste, you think that that's lowering your quality of life, but it doesn't. And how do I know that? Because here's me in 2021. This is a drop. This, if everybody in the world lived as I do, we would need a little over a third of an earth. So this is sustainable according to the Global Footprint Network. And I can tell you that my health, my, my quality of life, my time with family, it's all increased in this change. And it, it was faster than five years, but that's what I have shown here. So actually someone, I showed these slides to someone and they said, I should put a dotted line across here and change these to color. So this is what you need to live. And this is all waste. So going from here down to here, we don't even have to reach the world average to start leading. All we have to do is start lowering. Once we start lowering, we can then start to lead others. And this is, what I, this is one of my major, major initiatives. One of the things that I'm doing is to help people, especially in the most polluting areas, see if we wanna lead, if we wanna improve our lives, we can lower way, way down. So here we have here on this axis is action. How much do people act on the environment? And up here is learning and connection. So learning would be learning about the science and what's going on right now in different places in the world, as well as learning the connection. What is your connection to nature? Those who know me know about my sledding hill is one of my main examples of something in one's background that is a connection to nature. To me, that's a big part of it because why would someone act without learning? Because out here we have, there's a lot of environmentalists who say everyone should act. You should um, carpool, don't eat meat, things like that. And there's a lot of journalists who write articles, things like here's 10 little things you can do for the environment. Now the goal is to get compliance and they can often get compliance. And uh, let's look in the boxes, but first, why would someone learn but not connect? So up here we have people, scientists who are teaching facts, information, giving you the numbers, journalists with stories of disasters, so they're giving you knowledge, figuring if you know, then you'll act. So people in here don't know, don't care. There's a lot of people, that don't, they're not acting, they don't know anything. Uh, if we give them the benefit of the doubt, they're ignorant, they just don't know. Some people know a little bit and then don't wanna know anymore. Over here, people who are following the advice of environmentalists, following the advice of journalists, I think if you act, but you don't know why you're acting, it's not connected to anything, it starts to feel empty. Or if you work really hard, you feel like, oh, look at how much I'm doing. It's so much more than you, you should do some too. But eventually you start feeling, I mean, anyone here has gone without straws for a week, or if you're a meat lover and you go without meat for a while, you look at the world and you say, and you see it looks pretty much the same. What can one person do? What's the point? So it feels pointless. You feel resentment for people telling you what to do. Now, what about people who learn? And by the way, these are people who are following the advice of environmentalists and journalists. People, I can't fault them for following the advice of people who probably know better, but people maybe not trained in leadership because just telling people what to do compliance doesn't always lead to leadership. Up here, we have people who learned, but haven't acted. And the more you learn, there's just so much going on in the world. I think people start feeling outrage, but then they start feeling like, what am I supposed to do? I can't do anything. I feel hopeless. I feel helpless because there's so many things going on in the world. What am I supposed to do? And you start feeling like what one person does doesn't make a difference. 
And again, can't fault people here because they've been given all this information, but information alone rarely leads to action. Okay, what about this square over here? This is a big one. So this is people who act, but have a reason to act. There, I think you find self-discovery. I think you find a love of nature. And most of all, you, you feel a passion to act. You want to do things and feel enthusiasm. What gets you here is the Spodic method, which Dan, you've experienced it. It's when you, I walk you through sharing something in your life, uh, what, connecting with what the environment means to you, and then acting on those things. It may be big, it may be small, but if you care about it, one of the ways I put it, it's like less concerned with the y-intercept, more interested in the slope. Because <laughs> if you want to act and you're doing it for a reason, then so you know, both high in both axes, then it really resonates. Now, in my experience, when I first started avoiding packaged food, first I said I'm going to avoid packaged food. Then I learned that without eating, without you know, cooking on at home, gave me more delicious food. It was cheaper. It was more accessible. It would help the people most underserved by helping give access to them. Sometimes it goes the other way. So um, these are examples from a long time ago, like Coca-Cola. When I learned that they did business with South Africa, this is way back in the 80s. I learned that, and then I, I just couldn't do business with the company doing business with South Africa anymore. And I, just, I haven't had any Coca-Cola since. I don't, think, I don't think anything from Coca-Cola products. So anyway, you can act and then learn. You can learn and then act. But the more you do this, that's the early days. But after a while, you start learning that, or I started learning that the more that I act, the, the more acted with the connection, the more I liked it. So I started learning and acting. So people who know that I, my fridge has been unplugged for several months now. And when I learned about that most of the world doesn't refrigerate like we do, and I was like, oh, how do I ferment? And I just unplugged the fridge. So I had until the stuff in the, in the freezer melted to learn how to ferment it and ended up working really well. So I've learned that learning and acting together is very rewarding. So I keep, the more that I do, the more I want to do. And combine these. So down here in the lower corner is that original box. What happens when you keep doing these things, you keep going this diagonal. Oh, for context, the more you act without learning, the more you get resentment and fatigue. The more you learn without connection, the more you get more helpless outrage and resignation. But when you go into this box and keep going, you can lead to mastery because it's a performance-based art, living sustainably. And everyone has their way of experiencing it. But for me, because it started with food, first there was delicious, then it was fun. And then as I avoided flying, I got more adventure, community, connection, meaning, and purpose. And that's what happens when you act with connection. And one of the reasons I can't stand people who push just learning is that it, the farther you go on this axis, the farther you get away from here. And the farther you go in acting without meaning, the farther you get from this axis as well. So that's why I get so angry at people who just say, here's 10 little things you can do for the environment, or here's what's going on in this place and we should do something about it, but not actually connecting them. And this is the path that I'm getting people on. And once you're off to the races, it's really a joyful experience. Now, I know that not everybody is gonna go, like once you do this, what I call it when you get up into, this, into that square is uh, a transcendent sustainable experience. And once you're on that path, you enjoy being on that path. Now, some people go very far on that path, such as myself, where, well, I've gone pretty far, although I have a lot farther to go, where I'm not flying and things like that. For a lot of people, that's going to be a big deal. So more people are going to go a short distance on that path. And as we go out, fewer and fewer people will go farther and farther. But I'd like to, I, I could imagine billions of people in the world feeling like um, shifting from thinking consumption means higher quality of life to acting with more meaning and purpose doesn't necessarily mean lots of stuff. And then maybe I think that a few thousand people who at, at the stage where I am could lead the whole United States. But I know not everyone's gonna be out there, but what I'm looking for here is a come from behind win. Cause I think that, I think we're, we're in the bottom of the ninth inning and we're losing the game here uh, in terms of the environment. So if we wanna come from behind, you need everyone in the stands, even, you know, you need the, the, the um, the stars on the team to be scoring the points, but you also need everybody cheering. You can't, the, if, if the fans get up and leave the stadium because they want to beat the traffic, it's pretty tough to win with an empty stadium. So we need everyone doing, actually we benefit from everybody doing whatever part, but I think the more that you do, the more you'll want to go out here. And here's a story where I talk about, Dan, I'm sure I've told this one to you about when you learn, when you master 
a performance, an active social, emotional, expressive performance-based field, it becomes a part of you. The example I usually give it when you first learn to play guitar, the first thing you learn is like, oh, it's this thing made out of wood. It's got some strings. You turn these knobs up here and it tightens them and, uh, and you strum. Then the next lesson is you put your fingers on the frets and, you, and then later on you learn chord progressions and you learn songs and you learn lots of songs. And along the way, when, you, when you're playing songs, you're not thinking about is this, what is this thing? You, you're, you're doing it well, you're, you're expressing yourself. And when you go to lots of songs, you're not just connecting with the music, you're expressing yourself. Like someone who really knows how to play, you can like, take a happy song and play it sad. You take a sad song and play it happy. And then you start performing in front of others. And when you perform in front of others, then you, when you get really good, you're playing the audience. Maybe you want them to dance tonight. Maybe another night you want them to more uh, just listen. Maybe another night you want them to cry. And when you get to really advanced levels, you know, far out on that diagonal, then you start, I mean, Jimi Hendrix is not just playing for the people he's playing for, he's playing for all future guitarists. Bruce Springsteen is playing for everyone because they've reached that level. And that's available with acting on sustainability. So I think of it, the first step is to break the logjam. And that's what the Spodic method does, is to connect why you're doing it to something to do. And I, I think of that as a, it's breaking the logjam. I think people like acting, connecting with nature. I don't know anyone who doesn't like hiking in the woods or spending time on the beach in some way. Next is, well, you got to crawl. And that's the early things is things like changing your diet, maybe eating less meat or avoiding packaged food, transportation, carpooling, or taking public transit, biking. Um, you know, picking up litter, shopping less. These are mechanical, kind of like early chord progressions. You're not really playing music yet, but you're doing something. You know what you're doing. And that leads you to the next stage where you're walking. And then you're acting on your values. It's more about the relationships that you form with your family, your coworkers, the people you spend time with, your relationship with nature, and you're discovering things about yourself. After that, it's more running. After you crawl and rock, walk it, and you can run. Now you're acting for others. The, the focus is on how you're affecting others, even people far away from you the, uh, and on the other side of the world or future in time. And then it really gets to where you can fly. And this is thinking beyond just here and now. What's your legacy? What's your vision for the future? And what could happen? Because right now, I don't think anyone, I don't think there are many people who look at the world and say, this is exactly how it should be. 10 million people a year dying from just breathing the air. So what's a vision where we're not polluting the air? Now, if someone wants to go out really far and make a big difference, they want to be a leader. That's what I'm doing. That's what you're doing. I'm not sure as much you yet so far in sustainability, but if you want to lead, you have to have experience leading. You have to have experience in science. People who have experience in leading but don't know the science, they tend to come up with things that don't really work. So like um, carbon offsets or plastic recycling, not hurting people, except that they promote people consuming these things. So it actually can work against you. So people in here would be Al Gore, Bill McKibben, IPCC. I, I have nothing again. I don't know if the IPCC, you know, the UN group, I don't know if they, well, they won a Nobel Prize, but I don't know if they're, how much experience leading they have. But these are people who have experience leading, have experience in science. But here's what they don't have, is experience living sustainably. And if you don't have experience living sustainably, it's like, if you want to learn to, if you want to build muscles by going to the gym, it's very easy to, if you haven't gone to the gym to say, oh, I know what to do. I'll lift these weights in, in this progression. But that's not the challenge. The challenge is really going there when you feel tired. How do you handle an, industry, in, in, um, an injury? What if your friends say, oh, you'll never make it? Those are the things that, like, what about your sleep habits and your eating habits? These are the things that happen when you actually do it. So the people in here, they don't, they don't know that. By the way, the people, some, there's one big example of someone with experience with science and experience living sustainably, but without experience living, leading rather. And Greta Thunberg has some experience leading, but there's only so much you can get in three, four, five years or 18, 19 years of life. <clears throat> but people who have experience in all three of these things in this green zone, they can lead. And by the way, I want to share... Some people who, like, you think they might be in this zone here, but they're so far the opposite of living sustainably that advice when you hear it coming from McKinsey or BP or Shell or Biden or the UN, they have so the opposite of living sustainably that they don't, they're just off the charts ineffective. 
Any questions so far? No, I think it, it makes sense. And I think it's, it's interesting to see, even going back to the, to the chart you were talking about, about how the world is so far ahead of the U.S. in this area. It's pretty fascinating to think of if, if the U.S. just reduced to where the world was, the world would be almost able to be sustained within one earth. And then you take and you and you start talking about these behaviors. You, as you mentioned, you've walked me through this method and and really a couple of times. And each in each case, as I went out to take action, it got into my soul a bit and it started to reproduce. And as it as it started to reproduce, whether it be the fact that I haven't drank bottled water in a year and a half or or any other thing, it there is a certain joy in it. And I didn't understand that before doing it. And I think that's some of the some of the color to the charts is that is that there there is a there is a knowing that comes from the doing and that that it's combining, like you say, the learning and the action and all of that in one place. But I I greatly appreciate this progress and process. Yeah. And if the video didn't pick it up, Dan, when he said he didn't drink bottled water, he he indicated his reusable bottle. So he's drunk from containers. Right. which I presume you're feeling from tap. And he often talks about how when he committed to that, he had bottles of water that he had bought that he was going to drink. How, what's the status of them right now? They're still sitting in my closet exactly as yeah. they were. I, and, and it's interesting because I, I had attempted, and this I think is very relevant to what you're talking about, Josh, is that I had attempted on my own to switch away from bottled water a few times because others had told me to because, 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 right? And I had tried, I loved my bottled water because it tasted a certain way. I, it was convenient. It, it had all of the things that the, that the lovely sales pitches would tell you. And I was there. I was I was addicted to all of that. And when we talked and you asked, Dan, what's this small commitment you can make? I remember I looked down at the bottled water that I was drinking at that time in a plastic bottle and, I, and the cases that I'd been buying that everybody might grumble about carrying or whatever. And I said, I will not drink from a re, from a disposable bottle in the next month. And I I thought, man, this is going to be difficult and I'm probably going to hate it. And then at 30 days from now, I'll drink those cases of water that I've got in my closet. And that's not what happened. And I got to the end of the 30 days and I was and I was more in the mindset, well, this is this is cool. This is different. And it and it's not an inconvenience. And in fact, I feel better and I feel happier and I'm saving money and I'm saving process and I'm saving the, the environment in, in that partial way. But then it also started causing me to ask questions. And I think this is a lot of where you go. Started asking me, getting me to ask questions of, well, well, what's next? And where, where do I work through from there? And so it's had a, it's had a very surprising impact going through things in this way and, and having it build from the inside out, if you will, rather than having, rather than, than the changes I attempted to make before. And now I don't feel like pulled to go drink that water in my closet. It's not sitting there calling to me. It's more, it's more that I look at it and go, Oh man, I've got that there. I guess if we ever don't have tap water and I'm desperate, maybe I'll go through the last couple of cases, but I, I haven't touched, I haven't touched it since. A lot of people say what I say, which is, I wish I'd started earlier. I thought that's my, what you might've said. If you only started just before buying those bottles, you wouldn't have gotten them. I, I agree with that. I, I, I also would say, I wish I'd started before I ever bought any bottles yeah. because as I look at it, I knew that the bottles weren't good and other people, even other people in my life were saying, Hey, th this isn't good. And I never got there. And I look this, back and I, th and I think I drank thousands of bottles. And, and since then, I've also become sensitive of another thing, which is how pervasive the acceptance of this waste is. And when I walk into a doctor's office or I, wa or I walk into a, or I walk into a business and they're just like, here, have another bottle, have another bottle, have another bottle. And they'll literally toss it to you as you walk in or say, grab one there. And it is remarkable how, mu how much I see it now yeah, the, that I didn't see it before. Culturally, we've accepted it. Internally, we're twisted up inside. 
you said working from the inside out, the way I put it is in, going from extrinsic to intrinsic motivations, right. working with intrinsic. And then I have to qualify, or not qualify, but um, uh, you said, ask you to do a little thing, but I don't ask people to do little things. You I did ask not. people to do things based on their intrinsic motivation. Whether it's right. big or small, I don't care. That, that's a, that is zero. an important point. You, you, you asked me what commitment I was going to make. And, and I chose something that I thought would be little but big. It would be my little contribution, but I knew it would be a big thing for me. And as it turns out, it's a big contribution. As it turns out, also, we're an example to others. And so others have had conversations with me. And I know of a couple of others who have made a similar switch or have chosen to do their own thing. And the joy that you mentioned, I, I, I really believe that is a key of how you approach this versus anyone else that I've spoken with. And I've spoken with not nearly as many people as you have, but I've spoken with a number of people who care about the environment and who, uh, who are passionate and going down their own way, but I've not found anyone else able to unlock the joy that makes it a journey that you want to do rather than that you have to do. Yeah. Now, Hold that thought because that's going to, when we get to the, the slide that looks like this one, but it says systems on the left instead of peers, right. let's bring that up again. Because yeah. I think this is not recording our video, but just this slide. So I think people are just looking at the slide. So I want to do the vi more video stuff. Bring so it. Moving along, the balance sustainability is my term so far. I'll probably come up with something better for acting along that diagonal. So people who have not gone that far on the diagonal, so people who have off to the races, and then working by yourself, no peers, or working with peers. So there's don't know, don't care. Okay, so people who have acted but haven't engaged peers, it feels lonely. You feel misunderstood. People constantly say to me, Josh, I just don't have my mom. Josh, I don't have the passion for not flying that you do. I don't have a passion for not flying. That's, that's like, uh, to me, that's like saying you have a hobby of not collecting stamps. Right. It feels like you're swimming upstream. Now, what if you have peers, but you're not acting? So that's, you feel like an outside observer. Everyone's like pointing figures and you're committed. Oh, it's so terrible. Governments should change, corporations should change, but you're not doing anything yourself. Now, when you, when you start acting with peers, then it starts to feel normal. It feels natural, it's fun. And you feel like you're swimming downstream. Oh, actually, this is what I wanted to get at that I said to the table. Because when it's fun and you wanna share fun with others, not obligation, not compliance, not facts, but fun, joy, now you have the chance at ex ex exponential growth, which I think, yeah, here's the slide. So I had to illustrate it. So here's me. And at the beginning, the people around me are polluting. They're, as you described, it's what I call feeling twisted up inside, knowing that there's right. a problem, but not doing anything about it. And then one by one, I talk, I do the sporting method with them, and then they start acting more sustainably. And now for me, this is a natural state. Like, this is a little awkward. This is really fun. And of course, each one of those, they're going to go off and they have, they're the center of their own circle. So they have their people around them. But then because the sporting method is something you can learn and teach, and anyone can do it, then they start doing it and then so on and so on and so on. And if each, if each person for their own reasons shares joy with people around them, then not because I'm telling them to, but just because we like, you know, fresh vegetables and, and produce, you know, once, you're, once you've not eaten Doritos for a while, the taste buds come back then we'd like that. We want to share it with others. And then it becomes natural. And then they're going to want to do it too. So a conclusion is to engage and connect a strategy of engaging with people and connecting with people. So switching from facts, numbers, and instruction to finding what engages, finding what connects, engaging and connecting, and then teaching it. So it spreads. That's my strategy is not to um, tell people what to do. It's to change myself. That's, that's only table stakes. That gives me tells me what works, but what actually grows, changes into a movement is finding what engages, finding what connects. And then Spodic Method seems to do that pretty well. Now, another thing happens when you're acting on balanced sustainability and do you have role models? No or yes. So there's don't know, don't care. If you're acting, but you don't have any role models, it seems like hard work. It seems some, you have to push really hard. Some problems seem intractable. The big one for me was population. I knew that population drove a lot of pollution and makes every environmental issue harder, the bigger the population is. But the only thing I knew about managing population, there's the one child policy in China, 
which is forced abortions, sterilizations, tearing down your house if you have too many kids. There's eugenics, which makes that sound good. Right. And so for years, I mean, I read a, the book Limits to Growth probably 2005. So for a good 15 years, I just didn't talk about population because if the cure is worse than the disease, I'll take the disease. All right, if you have role models, but you're not acting, then you know, it's nice to know historical figures, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, but I don't think they'd want to be relegated to historical figures. They'd want their legacy to act in the greatest problems of any time, not just to know about what happened then. So, but if you just learn about them, but don't bring them into your life, it, it feels disconnected. But if you act and have these role models, things become easy and expected. We connect with historical figures and you tend to want to learn more. If I focus on solutions at work. So the big one here for me was Machai Virvaidya in Thailand. And I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of depth because he's been on the podcast. I've, had, I've written about him a lot and I've done podcast episodes on him. So look up Machai Virvaidya on, on this Sustainable Life podcast. But he in Thailand saw the problems with population growth and took it upon himself to do what I can only describe as the opposite of the one-child policy, where he would, like he brought condoms into schools and had kids play with them like balloons to lower the stigma, to make them just a normal thing, made sure that every taxi driver had birth control information. And the women who would go town to town would have um, birth control to bring with them. And they, he, he increased health, happiness, longevity, prosperity, abundance, stability, equality, while lowering the birth rate from something like seven children per couple to like two like the opposite of the one-child policy. Suddenly I had a role model I could act on. In, in business, there's W. Edwards Deming and all sorts of other role models that it turns out there's, while the sum total of all of our environmental problems are unique, everything that's been done, I keep finding more and more role models. So here a bunch, I'm not gonna go to them in, this, in here, but anyone who wants to contact me and hear about role models that have um, inspired me and given me hope and helped me do what I'm doing, let me know. Okay, here's a more advanced way of, of of, of looking at it, or something happens after you're doing this a lot, experience with systems. So as you act, if you don't really understand systems, actually, you, any questions so far since the last time we paused? No, man, I'm good. Is it interesting? <laughs> I, 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 think it's, I think it's important. Okay, yeah, I, I should say, this is like theory that I want people, for people who are interested, like, where's this going to go? Because if they just know, oh, Josh isn't flying, he takes two years to fill up a load of garbage, that's nice. Uh, maybe if enough people do it, it'll add up, but they don't really want to do it. And, it doesn't, and like, it's never going to catch on. So right. I want to show, th what these slides are about is it'll catch on. Like, what, what's going on behind the scenes? What's driving me? Why I'm full of enthusiasm and not just hope but expectation of success? Because I think that there's something here that the more it happens, the more it will happen more which I just do not see happening with giving people facts, figures, and instruction. So yes, I recognize this is a bit lectury. I hope not too much. <laughs> it's, a, it's all right. I, I think there's a piece of that, but I, I think there's also a lot, of, a, a lot of knowledge here and highlighting the difference between getting information and connecting with life change is, is an important distinction. Yeah, and bring other people along with you. So if you know systems but don't act, then you get, there's a lot of amazing stuff in learning about systems. And it tends to be from scientists, from business people, from academics. But most of the best books, they're not really connected to nature and life. They don't connect me, the reader. I, I just kind of learn interesting concepts. But when you get how, and nature, very complex systems. And systems have a way of, you push it to the left today and it moves to the right tomorrow. There's time delays, things happen in the opposite directions in weird ways. You try to get people to do stuff and they end up resisting you more because humans are complex systems as well. But when you combine them, see for me, just the wondrous discovery of how I interact with a system is to me amazing. And that would be enough for me. But then I start looking for leverage points of, of systems. For example, on the podcast, I don't, people always try to bring me people who are doing these small projects of like recycling or composting somewhere. And I'm, I'm glad that they're doing it, but I want people who are renowned influential people because they are leverage points of a system. Someone who's a CEO of a company, if that person changes, there's a much greater chance of the company changing than if just 
a rank and file employee does. Likewise, if that person does not change, it often doesn't. So that's why I have all these athletes and CEOs and um, Nobel Prize winner, um, well, Olympic it's, gold it's medalists. A, it's a little bit like, and, and I say this on my on my own podcast as well. I say, look, every every person has a story, and every person inherently has equal value, but not every person has equal influence. And that that influence, that ability to inspire change is that, that that's different depending upon as, as I think you're phrasing it, that leverage point and recognizing that is objectively matters and, and subjectively it changes the feel of everything. Yeah. This is, this is systems work. It's not just straight linear stuff. Right. And so myths revealing themselves like a big one here would be um, Elon Musk is producing a lot of electric cars. And a lot of people look at that and think if you look at one electric car, versus one internal combustion engine car. Well, there's zero emissions at the tailpipe. Even if you get it from fossil fuels, you're probably gaining by having an electric. But his strategy is more cars with the tactic of making them electric. We need fewer cars and the ones we can't get rid of, okay, electrify them. But the, on a strategic level, we're moving in opposite directions. He is, if you make a polluting system more efficient, you pollute more efficiently. I'm going to say that again. If you make a polluting system more efficient, you pollute more efficiently. If you grow a polluting system, you grow your pollution. If you change the direction of the system, change its goals, then you can make a difference. But he is accelerating in the direction we're already going. I often say Elon Musk is today's Robert Moses, for people who know who Robert Moses was. So that's one of the many myths, myths that people keep pushing because they don't get science. And so yeah, you got a lot of people doing what I call stepping on the gas, thinking it's the break, wanting congratulations. <laughs> so that leads to strategies. I'm, so there's a lot more stuff on that last slide of um, results from systems. I'm not going to go to that level of detail, but I will say l- strategies that emerge from when you get how systems work and, the st- and having peers and having role models is that look for leverage points. Right now, there, I, I bet that everyone watching and listening, if you c- can you name anyone who's renowned throughout the world or even your country or region who is living sustainably or even trying? Because I can't think of anyone. I mean, other than you, no. And I'm far from it. I'm just closer now than I used to be. Because actually that thing that said 0.37 Earths, there's still some things I'm using. I use fossil fuels, which are not, you cannot use fossil fuels and be uh, sustainable because that has to go away. Then the other big thing is, one of the other big things is what makes ideas spread? So joy and connection instead of doom, facts, and instruction. That way it accelerates. We all learned from early days in the pandemic. If, you, if it spreads to a small number of people, it eventually peters out. If it spreads to more people, it can grow exponentially. And I'm trying to get something that grows exponentially, which I think joy and connection do more than doom, facts, and instruction. So I grow my podcast. I, I spend less time on social media promoting it than almost anyone at any of the podcast, but I look for great hosts. Yeah, hosts, guests um, here, hosts, other people host my podcast. So there's other podcasts that are in the This Sustainable Life family. And then now I'm working on the book to reach the public, to reach a a much larger audience. And I want to create a cultural shift. And that's what, to change a system is not just to change little parts in it or make it more efficient. That's not changing the system. If we don't change the system, we'll be right back where we are. If we took all of the pollution levels and change them magically to pre-industrial, but kept our culture, we'd end up right back here again. So that's things that our culture is driven by. We value many things like family and health. Those I wouldn't change, but we value material growth. We value externalizing costs, comfort and convenience, extracting things from from nature and efficiency over resilience. And I, we could change to this other group of values, enjoying what you have, personal growth, not material growth, but personal growth. Take responsibility instead of externalizing costs meaning and purpose over just comfort and convenience, leaving nature how we found it, resilience. Now, when you're in this system, these values look weird. When you're in any system, anyone who's lived for a while in another country, you get there and for a while, you don't really get that system. You don't get that culture. You live your way and it's hard because things don't make sense. And at some point, if you live there long enough, you say, you know what, I'll just do it their way. And then things start making sense. And from that perspective, the old one looks kind of weird. This happened to me when I lived in France for a year in, in, uh, Shanghai for almost a year. And so 
between living in the US, living in China, you know, one culture is one way, one's another way. Not obvious which one one might pick. Living between this set of set of values and this one, you know, you could pick one, you could pick the other. One big difference. This one leads to billions of people dying. This one doesn't. So I prefer this one because of that reason. I think that's the last one here. Oh yeah. Uh, that was like some type stuff. And all right, so I'll stop recording. Actually, any comments before wrapping up? No, well, I, I think that <laughs> that impact of, look, in this case, the choice becomes obvious because billions of people die. That's, that's pretty powerful. And connecting with why billions of people die because of the overuse of the earth and needing seven earths or whatever it is to support everything. That's, that's a very powerful connection. And it shows the, it shows the need to make a change sooner than later, because we're already, what did you say? We're in the bottom of the ninth. Basically we're, we're way, we're way behind and we need to come from behind when that's something that I, I appreciate the imagery and I also appreciate the hope that comes with it that, Hey, there's still, however limited there is a window because I, I believe so many people end up feeling hopeless about this and they throw in the towel and are just like, well, whatever, what I do isn't going to matter. So screw this because it's too late. But what I hear you saying is it isn't necessarily too late. It's dangerous. We're very late, but it's not too late. And that as we find this joy and it spreads around the earth, that we can change things. Yeah, it's very easy for people to say, what I do doesn't matter. Only governments and corporations can make a difference. The plane was going to fly anyway. What difference does it make if I'm on it or not? These justify not really doing anything. And one can feel, well, I'm doing everything I can. You know, I got a solar panel on my roof and I got an electric car. But I think everyone knows that that's not sufficient. And they're not, I, see, people feel like, I'm doing the most that I can. And they're measuring it, they're measuring it by how much effort they're doing. Mm -hmm. And all these people saying, here's what you have to do, and here's what you have to know, they make it feel hard. But what matters, nature doesn't care about how hard you work, it cares about your effect on others. And when you care, when you're doing this, when you when you're on that diagonal, you start and, and you get to the stage where you're thinking about others. This acting in stewardship is no, it stops being a burden or chore or deprivation. And what we start realizing that perhaps the most human thing is how we act, how, caring how we act, how it affects others. I long ago realized there's too many things in the world that are, the, the world's too big and too beautiful for me to see all the sights. I'm never gonna see Machu Picchu. And even if I saw Machu Picchu, I'm not gonna see a bunch of other things. The best thing I can do is to enjoy where I am maximally at any time. And when I do that, I actually find just as much natural beauty and connection and diversity and whatever I want, whatever I want, I find it here. And then I can travel, but I don't have to. I end up biking to a, a national park or a state park nearby me and I get all that value. So I actually feel like I'm doing less because I connect more and more with people who are living sustainably. And people, I mean, before the industrial revolution, everybody lived sustainably. And before right. the Wright brothers, nobody flew and no one, I put to you that a lot of people who didn't fly traveled more. They may have gone a tiny fraction of the distance in miles, but much greater difference in cultural difference and things like that. Yeah, I, I would think that's the case. I was, I, I'm even thinking to just like when I was younger, I, I traveled a bunch, but I didn't fly. And that was, in many cases, monetarily driven when I was, when I was young, my family just didn't have a lot of money, but we went to a lot of places. And now there's this isolation component that comes in and also a mental component that comes in to, the, to almost teach people that if you didn't get on an airplane, it wasn't a real trip, right? Like it wasn't, it wasn't a place that you, that you were going. So I'm either home or I'm away. And that gap has become further over time. And so the, the transformation is, I think simpler to identify, but maybe, but less simple for people to step back from. Yeah. Everybody thinks that it's normal to fly. Like you said, it, it, if you're not flying, you're not living. I think a lot of people think you're even hurting the world because you're not right. being a citizen of the world and getting around. I've asked a bunch of people, how many, 
people who fly, so this is not a scientific survey or anything, but I ask people, what fraction of the world flies or doesn't fly? And the average number is roughly 50%. People think about half the people in the world fly and half the people don't. It's more like five or 10% fly. But the right. people who do fly often find themselves in, a, in a, an airport where everybody there flies. And so right. they think, well, I'm no, most of the time not in an airport, but when I am, everyone flies. So I guess that's probably everyone. Everyone isn't flying all the time, but sometimes they do. And here's the evidence. I can see it all around me. The people who fly yeah. think that everyone does. <laughs> it's not the case. Well, we put ourselves in our own bubble, right? Even if, even if we aren't in an airport, we're in a life where that's what people are talking about. We create our own bubble, just like people, those I, I'm in the personal development space. And those of us in that space get conditioned to think everybody wants to, and is ready to take steps forward and improve their life. But if you step out of the bubble and you look at the macro picture, you recognize it's less than 10% of people who are actually in a space where they want and are ready to improve their lives. And then you, then you see the impact of that bubble. And I think you're facing much the same, much the same conversation really. And re with regard to what you were saying before about the um, bottom of the ninth, I've read this report, I think by Cornell said by 2100, there may be a billion climate refugees. There may be 2 billion climate refugees. I think most people hear that and think that's a big number, two big numbers, right? I look at that and think the difference is a billion people that may or may not suffer. So let's just say the first billion is locked in that because of what humans have done for the past generations up until now, we can't change the past. So let's just say we can't do anything to prevent the 1 billion people from becoming climate refugees. Now climate, there's a whole lot of other issues going on. So that's going to be a lot of other things going on that I don't think that report took into account. And also, if you have a billion people moving from one area to another, the other people aren't like, great, we got lots of space. They're struggling too. So now there's, that means wars. That means not just refugees, but deaths. Right. All right. Let's just say we can pull through that. But our behavior from now forward can make the difference between 1 billion and 2 billion. Mm. Everything we do today matters. We can affect whether a billion people suffer or not. In fact, we can't help but affect that because right, one way or another, that's the, that's how nature works is that like nature is the perfect accountant. You can't think that just because no one notices it, nature keeps track of every molecule of carbon dioxide and methane and so forth. There's no getting around it. There's no hiding it. Likewise, everything we do is connected to everyone. Everyone makes a difference and it come from behind win. Every fan's cheering makes a difference. The owner of the team makes a difference who's not even in the stadium. The people watching at home, that makes a difference. Everyone makes a difference. And that's, what, that's why people talk about this opportunity, but it sounds to me hollow or vacuous, but when it, there really is an opportunity when you get on this path. It's a path of meaning and purpose and so forth. And, and it's it's... I'd rather not live in, in the situation we do. I'd rather it weren't this way, but given that it is, and we, uh, until you can change the past, that's our world. This is the opportunity. We can't undo that there will be suffering based on what generations have done up until now, but we can make the world better for everybody else. What is more human? What is more meaningful than to take responsibility for how your behavior affects others, especially those helpless, to defend themselves against painful consequences that you would cause. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's extremely powerful. And I, I, I really love your quote that in a come from behind when every fan's cheering matters, every action we take makes a difference. Like that, every, that every fan's cheering matters is not something that connects home for most people. But when you when you put it in the context and you recognize that it's every little bit, every little bit, big bit, all that, but the energy that builds together and creates the societal shift, that creates the cultural shift matters, especially in a come from behind win, like what we're talking about. That is very powerful. Yeah, I'm gonna share, I'm gonna close with a, an anecdote where um, I had occasion some years ago, something happened and I was jumping for joy. 
I wrote it. If you look on my on my blog for Jump for Joy, you'll see the the post. And I thought, how? When was the last time I jumped for joy? How often do, does an adult jump for joy? I just didn't think about it. I, I was like, I can't think of any time. Not long after that, I happened to be at a Yankees game, and like a friend had tickets, and then like last minute I go, and it wasn't even a great win because it was um, it was bottom of the ninth, and the second baseman for the other team dropped the ball, so it was an error. Huh. But a run scored. Everyone's on their feet, jumping for joy, cheering. Oh, the <laughs> people jumping for joy. We love come from behind wins and we can pull it out here. And I mean, you couldn't stop if you wanted to. That's what we, that's what we have ahead of us is something like that. All right. So I'm going to wrap that up. Anything to, that you want to close with? No, man. Thanks for including me as part of this. And I love the imagery. Thank you. <laughs>